we've learned a lot about public speaking. Now you're going to get to see somebody who has a ton of practice do it in real life. This is Taurus. He's hey awesome. <laughs> he builds motorcycles. He builds speakers. He builds companies. Companies. Which he, is probably the primary thing. <laughs> yeah. He built a company around building all of these things. Mm. And he's got an amazing workshop. I've been there a few times. It's like, it's as close to Candyland as you can ever get if you're into building things. Um, it's down in Gowanus. It's fantastic. You should check it out. But Have any of you heard of it? It's called Craftsman Avenue. No? Feel free to come by. <laughs> yeah. Stop by, take a look. You're going to walk in the front door and be like, well, my life is complete now. <laughs> anyway, um, with no further ado and no more me bothering anyone, Taurus. Thank you. What a, what a great uh, intro. I'm truly humble. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so just listening a couple of minutes of the content from Carl and James, it sounds like you're focusing more on the delivery aspect which is how do you communicate effectively, right? Uh, so this is a great sort of addition to, if you learn how to communicate effectively, you can essentially communicate whatever you want. And that's kind of the structure of this. So I assume you guys have been building on something, you're in the middle of developing, whether it's a product or idea or project, you're working on something, right? Uh, we have a course which is called How to Bring Your Idea to Life, which breaks down the whole complex thing of launching a project, a project or a company, and break it down into five simple steps that you can kind of follow. Obviously, there's a ton of complexity into each of the steps, but we kind of want to lift you up from a bird's eye perspective and get an overview of what, what exactly is the process of creating something, whether you're doing it physical or digital, it doesn't really matter. Um, to my uh, short about my background, I. Uh, Started a design agency in Stockholm, Sweden, which where I'm from, and started launching our own projects. Started working with a lot of startups, both uh, big companies, small companies, and Swedes. I don't know if you have a lot of experience with Swedish people, but uh, uh, we're usually kind of chill. We're reserved, um, not that good at selling ourselves, speaking in public. So when I moved to US, that was a huge hurdle, and I started pitching because there was no other option and being a designer usually for me it's like well I'm gonna let my work uh, do the talking I'm not this you know oil skin or skin oil salesman and it was just so unnatural so I walked up and like yeah I've been working on this app and uh, check it out it's really it's uh, it's a really good app uh, and then somebody came up after me someone like James or Carl and like, so for the last five years, the world has been redefining. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell? Is everyone in the US like a natural born entertainer, you know? Um, so I went home and like, all right, what should I do? What skills do I have to polish to be able to take my product, whatever I've designed or built, and create an inspiring story around me? Because a lot of people who are not designers, they look at something that you've built and like, well, that's cool, but so what? You know, um, so basically the structure of when you build something, you can easily break it down into, you have an idea, how do you make sure you validate the idea? How do you make sure that your idea has legs? You know, is it something that is worth pursuing? Is it something that you want to dedicate the rest five, 10 years of your life for? Next up is how to prototype this. Uh, so each of these sessions are about two, three hours. So I'm just going to give you sort of an overall view. And this is where we're going to be uh, focusing on pitch decks. So I assume you are in the process of creating something. And you're just about entering into how do I sort of unveil this to the world, right? How do I create a platform and get feedback? Because your pitch is never going to be final. It's going to be a living entity. And as soon as you pitch it to someone, uh, Try to get as much feedback as possible. Now, here's a little balance. Like, don't go out and uh, try to get feedback from everyone. Because the feedback that your mom is going to give you is going to be radically different than feedback from a venture capitalist. So try to identify what is the validity in that feedback. And then go back and think, 
does that apply to my project? Is this even valid for me? If you feel that it's not, then disregard it. But I've seen a lot of startups kind of get this, all right, let's do this. And whatever feedback they get, they try to kind of, you know, be aggressive and like, no, 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 you don't understand my product. So just drop your guard down, be super humble, and listen to everything they say. Thank you, you know, and just move on. Um, so before we begin, I would like you to write down your, uh, your pitch, 30 seconds. It could be two, three simple sentences, basically. This is what I'm working on, this is why it's gonna change the world, and this is my way forward. Okay, so take, I'd say one or two minutes. Just don't think, write down the first thing that comes to your mind. Any volunteers who wanna read it up real fast? If you're gonna be pitching, you, you gotta be pitching. All right, yeah, I, I know you, you oh, almost, you got it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is a safe environment. <laughs> do you want my hand up on my mic? You want to get up there and do it? Let's on, do that. Come on, come on, go. Yeah, this is a safe environment. <laughs> <part, laughs> they're supposed to support me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is he your uh, teammate? Yes. Mm. He is supporting You have to alternate to sooner or later, but okay, now you can learn from each other. <laughs> okay. What we're providing is to create a hands free light source for both business and casual users, while providing the protection that they need. One of the many hurdles for providing light sources is that you need one of your hands, and we, we only have two hands, which could be very limiting depending on what situation that you are in. So that is our market. Cool, 30 seconds, nice. Anyone else? I want one more, you, you look very curious. Oh, can, I, can I do it? All right, let's do it. So hi, my friends and I have been developing a social media tool called EarthPack. And the social media tool helps educate people to help them reduce and track their carbon footprint. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, so keep your notes and uh, don't think about them anymore. So the whole idea about your pitch deck is to, uh, to tell a story about what you're working on. And a lot of times, I don't know if you've been to any pitch events, but I've been, I've been to hundreds. And you have a networking thing, you show up there, there's a table that's filled with a pizza, and you hang out and you talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you're from here and there, this is what you're working on, and it's a casual conversation. And then the pitching starts, and then everyone turns into a robot. So you walk up and say, Hi, my name is uh, James. I've been working on this uh, a project. Uh, our market is 35% uh, millennials, and they will. Uh, that's not the dynamic you had just five minutes before. So something strange happens, and I'm sure you've kind of covered this in the, in the deliveries. Whenever somebody asks you, what are you working on, suddenly you get into this pitch mode. It's like, oh, no, <laughs> this person expe ex expects me to be professional and uh, know my 30-second uh, elevator pitch from inside and out. You should know it, but you should not do it as a elevator pitch that you would email out. So your conversational piece is completely different than the email pitch you send out in a pitch deck. So try to figure out uh, how do you add your personal story into that? And it could be, well, it just happened to be, uh, I was working on this vintage motorbike in, in my shop and I figured out why hasn't anyone made the Tesla of electric motorcycles? And I started exploring the market, and it turns out there's nothing, nothing out there. So I went out and started finding who's doing this, and I found foam companies that are doing something similar. And, you know, so you kind of get the idea that you're telling a story, you're not pitching. Um, the big misconception about pitch decks is, especially if you're going to go out and raise cash, uh, talk to angels, venture capitalists, as they say, uh, send me your pitch deck. And a lot of people say, well, awesome, I'll just make my pitch deck perfect and the pitch deck, I'm gonna raise $100,000. So the pitch decks don't raise money, uh, you do. So the thing is, the whole idea with a good drafted pitch deck is to get you to the next meeting. And if you send your pitch deck to a potential collaborator, partner, uh, venture capitalist, angel investor, Whoever, the whole idea is for them to open the pitch deck, go through it, and see, 
hmm, this is interesting. I want to meet that person in life. I haven't heard of a single company that raised money off of a pitch deck. The check always came after you had a personal interaction with whoever you're going to be working with. So, but the pitch deck is the first sort of stepping stone to get you to the next meeting. Does that make sense? Um, three simple sort of uh, takeaways that a pitch deck should convey. So this is what you want people to kind of leave with after they've gone through your pitch deck, which is, what is your story? And why, why should they care? Uh, what is your product? What is your solution? What have you created that is going to you know, change the world? And number three, what is your roadmap? Do you, do you have a strategy to keep working on this? Uh, if you don't, and I've seen a lot of pitch decks that focus so much on number one or two, amazing story, amazing product, and then the investor says, okay, cool, so where do you see yourself in a year, in two, three years? They say, uh, I don't know, I'm just going to keep working on it and see how it evolves. Even though if you don't know where the market is going, and frankly, today we have no idea where you know, our society is going to be in five years, but at least have some sort of a vision. Tell them that this is what I've been working on, but I know that in five years we're going to live in a completely different world, and my project or company is going to be adaptable. And they see that, oh, wow, you know, this person thinks ahead, and I'm willing to bet my money on that person, because even though he created an amazing product now, I know that the company is constantly going to reinvent themselves. So um, there's no sort of concrete formula to a, a pitch deck, but there's a structure. And I think if you, everyone has sort of their own kind of approach to it. And uh, I created this out over, I don't know, maybe working with 50 startups and kind of honing the, the delivery of it. And the structure is based on a classic approach to storytelling. So, you know, one of the most famous uh, uh, books on storytelling is the Bible. And if you kind of see that from that perspective, it's like, here's a problem, here's the solution, right? The pitch deck has the same thing. Here's a problem, here's a solution. Uh, I don't know if you read uh, Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero's Journey, which is also follows the same sort of aspect of storytelling. Uh, here's a problem, you go out building something, and then you bring it to the world. So on a high concept level, once you start seeing things in those kind of patterns, everything just kind of makes sense. And then you go away from this formulaic approach, it's like you've been working on this. Um, so this is kind of, uh, yeah, so the idea with pitch checks is, again, get you to the next meeting. And the pitch check is usually the first uh, visual representation that people see when you send it out. So when you send it to an angel investor, potential partner, this is the first thing that they open. So make sure it's tight, make sure that you have formulated your thoughts, your project into something very clear and very concise. Because the VC or the angel is not gonna open up your pitch text second time if he's not interested. He's gonna open it, not interested, trash it. And that's it. Unless you get a personal recommendation again. I'm a little confused. Wait, so is the pitch deck the presentation? The, the pitch deck is 10 slides, exactly. Okay. Uh, so I don't know what your, the format of uh, of your pitch, I'm sure you're gonna go up, uh, up in pitch. Uh, are you? Are they gonna have a visual? Yeah. Yeah. So that is that would be a complement to sort of your, you know, in life performance. Uh, but this pitch tech, most often, once you got start building something and you want to build a company, this is a pitch tech you're gonna send to every angel, every venture capitalist, every partner that you might want to work with, every uh, company that you want. Uh, to have something made for you. So this is kind of a condensed version of everything you worked with over the last year or months. As new, what I showed you earlier was a pitch deck. <clears throat> and this is usually the structure of a pitch deck. Try to keep it to 10 slides, 15 slides more. Uh, people just don't have any, any attention span anymore. So make sure uh, about 10 seconds per slide, which is elevator pitch, problem market, Elevator pitch is a one-liner that describes your service or product. So uh, before, there was a lot of sort of pitch instructors said, you know what, build up a story, make them exciting. 
Uh, yes, still, but if you look at an average venture capitalist, uh, they get about 5,000 pitches a year. That means 13 pitch decks a day. So the amount of information is insane. And sometimes they don't even scroll to the third page. If you start with a high vision thing, you know, uh, sitting, meditating on top of a mountain, they're like, oh, close. So capture their intention from the first slide and get into your product and vision. And then, from then on, you can sort of build up the story again. So elevator pitch. Um, this is obviously Tesla. So read through it and think about the structure of it. And then we can sort of break this down. See, most companies, they would have started with, we make great electric cars. This is really important for the future of the world. And most people would say, awesome, cool, you make great electric cars. There are a lot of other companies that do great electric cars. And in 10 years, everybody's going to be doing electric cars. So they, in just two sentences, they baked in, what is their purpose to exist? Why are they doing this? Well, the problem is, you know, we have record high CO atmosphere, yada, yada, yada. So here they build up the story. They create a foundation for what's to come. So now we know, oh, shit, you know, this is not looking good. And here comes the solution or the problem. What can we do? We can make, can they make a difference? Yes, they can make a difference. And this is what they're trying to do. They're not saying they've already done this. They're not saying they're the greatest or the best, but staying humble and saying, we're trying to do this. And they just happen to make electric cars. So Tesla is not a car company. Tesla is an energy company. The product just happens to be cars, which means that this company will constantly reinvent itself. Maybe we're not gonna have cars in five years. We're gonna have you know, teleport devices or flying. I'm sure Tesla is gonna be part of the future because this is their vision. How can they change what the problem is? So try to think in those, uh, in that framing when you pitch. Talk, don't talk so much about your product because your product is most likely gonna change. Uh, the problem, so what is the unmet need, problem you're solving, describe the pain points, and integrate your personal story. It's usually always starts with your personal story. You, you know, you're working on something in a dark corner and then you get an insight. Oh, wow, why hasn't anyone done this before? And then you start to investigate why people haven't done this before. Uh, or seemingly two unconnected ideas suddenly emerge and then you're like, oh, this might be worth to pursue. So tell that story. A lot of people find that interesting. Not, here's a bottle, I made it out of plastic. Oh, uh, cool, uh, see ya. So wh why, okay? Have you seen uh, Simon Sinek's uh, TED Talk? Uh, I think it's called. They were supposed to. Huh? They were supposed to. <laughs> they were supposed to, yeah, watch it. I mean, it, it, he, he it, it, I think it's the most popular TED Talk throughout all times. And uh, after you see it, it just makes perfect sense. So. This kind of captures it, that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. So start again with why are you doing this? Why are you building this amazing thing? Uh, then we have a slide which is the market. Who is your customer? What is the market size? What are the opportunities? And this is just pure research. Uh, I've seen so many startups that present a product or a solution. And then you ask them, well, who are you selling this to? They're like, well, I don't know, everyone. Um, probably not a, not a good idea. So try to find a niche. Try to find somebody who is uh, really communicating the way you do, and somebody who would resonate with whatever product you're selling. Uh, I get it that you want to capture as greater market as possible. But the thing is, if, again, if you're talking to everyone, you're essentially talking to no one. So don't be afraid to find a little group of people and make them your fans. And then if they like it, there's always opportunity to grow from that. So do your research, try to figure out uh, where do these people live? Uh, what do they buy? What is their behavior? And then kind of tailor your messaging accordingly. And that translates into your visual identity, your logotype, your copywriting, your packaging, all of it. 
This is uh, Casper's slide, and um, I think they're worth, I don't know, $4 billion now. And the guys are selling uh, mattresses, right? So they haven't created anything disruptive. What they did, though, is identify a market that is just so outdated. And you see the sleepies uh, usually placed somewhere in the middle of an uh, you know, industrial area. And these two guys came and said, why hasn't anyone made a mattress company attractive with good design, uh, user-friendly uh, messaging? And the product happens to be good. It, it's an amazing, uh, amazing product. But they just reframed the whole approach to it. Um, this is their market slide, which is first point, huge uh, opportunity, 35 million mattresses sold a year, uh, how big the market is. So if you look at it, you're like, all right, cool. I understand it's a big market. Then we have a slide, which is solution. Uh, how have you solved the problem that you just stated? And for whom have you solved this problem? Short slide, just uh, if you're working on something that involves a lot of uh, proprietary technology engineering, uh, this could be a good sort of um, segue into your product to say that our team is uh, top Google engineers or we have developed a winning algorithm. Most people don't really care about that unless they're engineers, but the, a lot of VCs are looking for something that is sort of patentable and that they can monetize later. But if you're working on a product, just focus on, on the people. Uh, what solution have you created that makes it better for someone? Don't get too technical. Um, and this again, this is um, Simon Sinek's basically uh, talk about the solution uh, to the problem and not less uh, about the product. Uh, so start with why. Why have you created this? Why do you believe it actually going to solve something in the world? Uh, and then you could go in, this is how I made it. And then the last is this happens to be the product. And again, most companies start with, this is what I made, and I used CNC machining. Why? Hmm. I don't know, because I want to sell it. Then you go into your product, which is kind of the whole, you know, everything up to here, you kind of built that up. So now people are excited. They're like, what has this person built? I want to see this. Uh, this is where you demonstrate what is unique about your product. Uh, what is the design? Uh, tell a story and don't write. I've seen so many decks that uh, a whole paragraph about their product. Show the visuals. Show a video around it. Show the progress, making of. Even if it's not complete, involve them into your process to show that th this is my prototype and this is how I made it. Um, MacBook or uh, what do you call it, Windows? Uh, I don't even know what the company's called anymore. <laughs> they, uh, you, they're still big, but the thing is, everyone knows that Windows is not exactly known for their user friendliness or usability. That's why this company happens to be the most valued company in the world. Uh, and if you would look how these two companies communicate, it's vastly different. So Windows, or a personal computer, would communicate their product in a way, you know, 2.8 gigahertz, quad core, seventh generation, just numbers, right? So unless you're an engineer, this means nothing to you. Apple, however, communicates usually in their languages, razor thin, feather light, the brightest and colorful display ever. All day battery, right? This resonates with everyone. Who doesn't want to have a razor thin, featherweight computer? Uh, now, obviously they have all this, but that's not what they highlight. And if you're an investor, what you read is, I don't care, and that sounds awesome. Let's go and uh, help you build this thing. All right? Uh, this also, you're probably too young, but way back, um, we actually bought software in boxes when we went to stores. Uh, I don't believe anyone does that anymore. So this is a classical slide of how Microsoft uh, communicated their packaging or their product. Uh, some sort of digital imaging, uh, you know, they wanted to add, this is all the features that this program can do and colorful and quickly organized. And Apple decided to put a snow leopard that has nothing to do uh, with their product. Now, if you would see these two on a shelf, which one would you uh, naturally gravitate towards, right? So, again, being rational and uh, showing all your features, mm, not so great because people buy with their stomach, not with their brain. But then, of course, 
you have to create an amazing product. If they get home, open something that didn't work, pff, they would scrap it. So choose what is sort of the, the, the key in your product, right? Highlight it and just make it really easy to digest for people. Competition, <clears throat> also super important. And uh, it can be a little bit frightening sometimes. You've been working on your idea. And then you see somebody who launched something similar. And you say, oh, OK, I'm screwed. This is never going to work because these guys already have sold their products and so on and so on. Uh, competition is healthy. And if you say that you have no competitors, it's a huge red flag for a lot of investors. Why? Because if there's no competitors, it means it's more or less impossible to make it. Or it's so stupid that nobody has made it before. So why would they bet on you? Um, and they're, they're, sure, unicorn companies that created something that never existed before. But the vast majority should have some sort of validation before they launch something. So be honest and truly show that, yes, we have competitors. This is what our competitors uh, do already in the market. And this is what makes us different. That shows that you've done your market research and you're humble enough to understand that you're not the only one in this market. Uh, what are your competitive advantages? And also be, uh, be uh, frank about your risks. Because the investors will probably know your risks better than you do. Because they've listened to a thousand companies like you before. So if they ask you, well, you know, uh, what happens if you run out of cash in three years? Make sure you have a backup. Make sure you understand that is a risk and not, you know, that everything is dreamy. And, uh, here is something that is called competitor landscape. And this is from uh, Airbnb, uh, Air, Airbnb slide. Back then, they were called Air uh, Bed and Breakfast. Um, what this competitor slide usually does is you, you map out on a chart uh, where you want to position yourself. So their uh, access are affordable, expensive, offline, online. This is a very sort of visual representation and that gives you immediate uh, understanding of where in the market this company belongs. So Airbnb are affordable and they're based in the online transaction. Hotels.com are expensive. So try to do that not just for uh, the pitch deck or investors, but also for yourself. So if you see that you happen to have six companies over here and you're also there, it's going to be a little bit hard for you to differentiate yourself. So try to figure out something, you know, how, where can you be that makes you a little bit more unique? Taurus, I have a question. So sure. if, there are six, if there are six companies in the upper right-hand corner, should I just leave some of them out so that the yeah. sees? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, what I usually do is I take a company that they know of and then a couple companies that nobody has ever heard of. So you place yourself somewhere in the, in the middle. Like everybody heard about Airbnb, you know, they, the guys are doing great. So you want to be kind of close to them. And then you add a couple of startups that are like, oh, these guys are competing, but they're not really there yet. So, but it's, it's, it's just about getting feedback. You know, you're going to present the slide and people are like, well, I don't believe that that should be your positioning. So you'll figure it out. Uh, team, super important. Uh, why do you have the skills? that uh, are required to make this a success. Uh, who's in your team? And uh, don't go on for 10 pages. I've seen founders who are really in love with themselves where the pitch deck is seven slides and their bio is 10 slides, where they want to showcase you know, all of their accomplishments and all their features. Uh, so just highlight something that's relevant for this company. Uh, if you worked on something that is not really relevant, I would think of uh, maybe not including that. Uh, your business model, which uh, if you are design driven, this is usually the most boring part. But if you're a VC, this is usually one of the most important parts for them. So, and for me, it took years to understand what a PNL is or try to extract uh, important numbers. So budgeting and numbers, if that's not your thing, try to find somebody who loves to do that and tell them, hey, I'm working on this product. This is how much I intend to charge for it can you help me create a budget and a financial plan? And that person is going to do that. So you don't have to become a master um, analyst, but you have to know that this thing makes sense from a business perspective, that you have a business model, that you have revenue streams. If this is just a passion project, it's going to be a little bit harder for you to raise uh, 
raise money. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so basically, business model is how do you make money, and the financial says, does that make sense, right? So, uh, what are your expenses? How much does it cost to produce your product? What is your sales and distribution uh, strategy, and so on? Uh, you might have a business plan, but if the numbers don't add up, and I've seen a ton of uh, projects where it's just like, you know, this is an awesome idea, but we just can't make the numbers work. Um, and that could, that could ruin uh, a lot of companies. And every day a company goes out of business because they have an amazing product, they have a million users. It's just, they're not, they're not profitable. So this would be a very simple finance slide, which is, you know, this could be uh, your revenue. This is your plan to finance the company. So seed, seed, series A. And uh, this is where the money comes from. So angels, incubators, venture capitalists. And roadmap, which is um, um, a great thing to uh, end on. So now you presented everything you worked on, right? You built up a story. Your product is amazing. Now what happens after that? You want to show the, uh, whoever you're pitching, whoever is going to give you money or work with you, is what is your plan for the next three, six, one year, three years? Uh, what are your milestones? What are you trying to achieve? Uh, and how do you intend to use the investment? So many times I've heard venture capitalists say, cool, I'm going to give you 500000 What are you going to do with them? And then the company's like, oh, I don't know. We'll figure it out. So I'll, uh, just give me the money, and I'll show you. Um, so show them first, and then maybe they're going to give you the money. And motivate. Why do you need this kind of money? And a lot of startups today, it's just some weird culture that I don't really understand, that everyone's out chasing money. Uh, try to build something that you actually can show that you've made this. And then go out and raise money. Don't raise money for the sake of raising money. Um, one of my friends, he raised just uh, $6 million. And the company is still not profitable. And he spends probably 85% of his time traveling around the world, meeting angels and venture capitalists. And the product is not going anywhere, yet it's all about hype. That is, personally, I don't really buy into that philosophy. So don't take money for the sake of taking money. And that will probably increase your probability uh, of success. Just because you have a ton of money on the bank does not mean you're going to be able to create a, a winning concept or a product. Um, <clears throat> and with an ask, also why, uh, what do you want from this? So if you're uh, sending this to a potential partner, uh, tell them that we would love to work with you because of this and this and this. If you send a pitch deck without an ask, then the person's going to look through it and like, oh, cool, awesome. Um, what, do you, what do you need me for? So uh, try to adapt this slide. Uh, to whoever you send this to. If you send it to an investor, adapt it and ask, we are looking for funding. If you're sending this to a potential employee uh, or somebody that you want to work with, end the slide, we would love to partner up with you because we might find this and this and this of interest to you. So take it from their perspective, not from, from your. Um, try to keep uh, mostly visuals, no text. And um, yeah, this, uh, this is really important. Reflect and improve. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, your pitch deck is an evolving entity. So try to get as much feedback as possible and uh, go back and iterate it. If you present it and you feel that the crowd is kind of lukewarm, they're not very excited by your product, try to pinpoint wh where did you lose them. Where did that sort of become less interesting? And then go back to that slide and tweak it a little bit. And you know, sometimes it's just about sort of reframing one thing. And you notice you know, they kind of lean forward like, oh, what is this thing? Tell me more about that. So if you identify what people get excited about, try to add more on that and remove something that's less interesting. Does that make sense? So yeah, the whole thing is uh, you know, take them on a journey, leading them uh, feeling inspired. Wow, you know, I love what these guys are working on, and I can't wait to see what's next or uh, get involved somehow or help them fund this thing. Uh, yet, most pitch texts that you see is like, mm, nah, don't believe it. Click, right? So try to, try to really 
capture something that is of interest. And if it's not interesting to you, if you look through your pitch deck and you're like, no, nah, I don't believe in it, nobody else is going to believe in it. Um, but also find a balance of being realistic, right? Is this something you can truly uh, execute and be confident in, in the delivery? Uh, oh, yeah. If, are you interested in, uh, like, hearing about investors? If you're going to be pitching a lot, there's a, there's a whole uh, thing about investors. Depends who you go to. Usually, if you um, if you just want to get your project off the ground, there's something called friends and family round, which is you go to your friends and you go to your family and you say, "This is what I've been working on. I need you know twenty thousand dollars to get it off the ground." Um, <laughs> those people usually are not going to ask you for your pitch deck. Um, because they invest in you as a person. They don't invest in you as a company or an idea. Um, so that's usually the first kind of simplest step. Second step after friends and family, okay, maybe you're ready to scale. Maybe you want to do your first hire. That's when you do a something called seed round. So you go to uh, an angel investor or high net worth individual, uh, usually not venture capital, because venture capitalists, uh, they invest in companies that show traction or growth or they have already some sort of revenue stream. Um, so business angels are the guys that you're going to be pitching most to. And uh, that's where you gotta, you got to be on your game. you got to know what your, your company is about, your project is about. You have to have polished your pitch deck and then basically feel ready to, okay, now I can take this check of 100000 And then the next step comes from venture capital. Now, not all companies have to go through the VC route. And if you can, try to avoid it. Uh, VC. Also, like in the startup world, uh, they call it vulture capitals because they tend to give you a big uh, check and then they sit on the board of your company and then kind of drive it with you. So, so many founders are like, I can't, I can't be with this company. And they basically exit and then the venture capital uh, takes the company out of business or they lose their vision. So my recommendation, if you can stay away from VCs, do that. And there are companies that are fully successfully funded without going uh, through venture capital. And that's where you come in into creating a product that has a uh, product market fit that you can actually sell and make, uh, turn into a profitable business. Uh, okay, we're done. So uh, what we are going to do now is, I know it's a ton of content, but look back at your pitch that you wrote in the beginning and try to rewrite that and try to cover these uh, points. And hopefully you'll end up with something closer to the Tesla's pitch, right? Starts with what have you identified? To whom? How have you uh, solved this? What made you different? And where are you headed? And this one could be a little bit longer. It could be, um, it could be half a, half a page, and write it in the style of a conversation, right? And then we're going to do, I don't know, a couple more people and see how, how that performs. If you have any questions, um, you can shoot them now or after the pitch, up to you. Yeah, you can go. Uh, no, I was going to shoot it after. All right, cool. I was going to mention, no, I'll just say no. I was going to mention, because last week, um, when, I think it was last week, not last, the last time that we had a person come over, I did a pitch and he said that I had to, I should, it was better for me to mention my product in the very beginning so people know what I'm talking about. Hmm. And um, but now I feel like I'm getting the impression that you're saying not to necessarily mention that in the beginning, like lay out this kind of vision first and then say, oh, we also do this and this is how it's contributing to this kind of thing. Right, right. It was like flipped. <clears throat> sure. Uh, I would say it depends on the context mm -hmm. and also who you're speaking to. So uh, there's no sort of one size fits all pitch, right? It totally depends on the group and the context. Uh, and being an effective communicator is not a, about effectively delivering your message, but understanding who you are communicating with. So if you're t speaking to somebody who is super analytical, you know, and Again, me being a designer, I, initially I had no idea who I was talking to. I was talking 90% about design and composition and texture. And this person is like, boring. So do a little bit of research uh, before you're meeting someone. 
And what I usually do, I go to LinkedIn and I see who is this guy, what, what is his past, where did he work? Was he VP of marketing? Aha, uh -huh, interesting, okay. So maybe I should lead with this. Uh, but still, you always have to fall back on sort of your, your own vision, you know. And don't, don't, if somebody tells you, oh no, you should start with, with your product, that's, he's coming from his uh, background and, uh, you know, the way he figured out what works for him. And at the end of the day, you gotta f figure out what works for you guys. Uh, because there are no templates, there are no structures. This is sort of a, uh, you know, a guideline, a sort of roadmap. If you stick to it, it's, a, it's kind of a nice thing to fall back on. But you will find out the more you pitch that you're going to develop your own style and you're going to figure out, hmm, this is, this is more of my vibe, you know. To that point, um, so the, per the person who was here last time was um, Blake Eskin from Design Observer. He was a big part of the success of This American Life very early mm -hmm. on. So he is a, one of the quintessential storytellers. And so for him, product comes first because then you tell the product and then you can build a story around it. Now, Taurus is a product builder and a, and a creative altogether. So for him, he wants to weave a story and then bring in the product. Because the product is, so for Blake, the product is not his baby. Hmm. The product is the thing he's building off of. But when the product's your baby, then you build to it. You tell the story to get people hooked into the idea of your product. And then you talk about the product. Now it's very dependent on who you're talking to. Hmm. You're gonna run into Blake's, you're gonna run into Taurus's, you're gonna run into me, and I'm a very different person than either of them. <laughs> so it's, and we're gonna have one of, each type of personality on the final panel. So the best thing we can say is take everything you've learned through this course and build the pitch that fits you best because you've heard a lot of different angles around pitching. I'm a more technical pitcher. <clears throat> this is a more storytelling based pitch. And Blake was very much build the story around your product versus building the product to fit your story or building a story to fit your product. It's not build, build a product to fit your story. Like, you can do either way, just do what works for you. Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I have a question on how to actually find the proper uh, investor. <laughs> like, is there a certain keywords we can search online, or is there <laughs> a platform we can use to find investors? Yeah, so th the best would be a personal introduction, by far. Because uh, angels, investors, they get so many called emails on a daily basis. The likelihood of them even opening your pitch is slim to none. So try to find somebody who can make a personal introduction. Or go to the events where they tend to hang out. Now from my personal experience, I haven't got a single investor from one of those pitch meetings. But what I learned is the whole dynamics of this, of how this thing operates, you know? And usually investors that go to pitch meetings, they're not there to find the startup to invest in, but rather to map out the landscape of what's going on. And then they go home and do their own research. Um, but what that gives you is a great opportunity to practice your pitch. So go to these events, and there are a ton of them in New York City, and find this guy. It's like, hey, I just want to run uh, this idea by you. And then you run your pitch. And that way you actually get data from not your mom, but from this investor who heard 1,000 other pitches. Um, and then after you, it's also important to, do, to find who, what kind of investor do you think uh, fits your company. So and there's something called smart money and stupid money. So stupid money is just somebody that gives you a check and like, cool, you know, run with it. I want nothing uh, to do with, with your company. I just want to get a 10x return. Then you have smart money, people who are actually passionate and invested in your project. And that's what I recommend. Try to find an investor who's like, oh, awesome. You know what? I believe in that, and here's a check. And that person is also going to go to every event he goes to and is like, hey, I just invested in this really cool company. Uh, check out what they do. So that investor becomes your brand ambassador as well. Uh, it takes a little bit more time to find that person, but long run, more worth it. As instead of just like, yes, I found this guy. He gave me a check, and I've never heard from him again. But in terms of uh, platforms, there's something called AngelList, which basically has all, all angel investors. 
and um, you create a profile for your company, you add your team members, uh, you upload your pitch deck, and uh, sometimes the investors find you, most probably they will not, just because again, they have thousands of startups reaching out to them. Um, so yeah, finding investment is not an easy thing, and it's a lot of legwork. Um, if my strategy is, you know, do amazing work so they find you instead of uh, you kind of running around pitching a thousand. Because again, you lose your focus from what you're intended to do. All right, guys, anyone wants to come up and uh, run a pitch? Yeah. Can I look at the Yeah, yeah, for sure. You'll have plenty of time to practice, so. Hold the microphone. <coughs> Grab the microphone off the table. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so, our carbon emissions are causing detrimental effects on the environment, and individuals don't um, are not aware uh, how their carbon footprint affects uh, has an effect on this. Uh, we want to create a tool for the individual to calculate, reduce, and track their carbon footprint in a convenient and sustainable way. We want to start with a prototype social media tool to launch in universities and then proceed to general youth. Beautiful. I'm hooked. Yeah. Where, where can I sign up for this? <laughs> you see how simple, 30 seconds, but you created a story. Uh, you told what, what is the problem? You know, who is the consumer? What are you building? And then what is it? That, that's all you need. That's brilliant. Yeah. Well done. And then just practice it so it just comes naturally, you know? And like James said, if you want to walk around, record it, uh, stand in front of a mirror, or just do it over and over and over again. Well Would done. Would it help if I did one on my cell phone? So, like, sold you my cell phone? <coughs> yeah. As a product? Can you, wait, can you sell this bottle instead? All, yeah, absolutely. Let's see your improv skills. All right. <laughs> so, how many times have you guys been out of the house and you really just needed something to quench your thirst and you haven't had anything around? Or maybe you're walking in the woods and you run past a bur bubbling stream and you just realize you have no way to capture that water without getting on your hands and knees, getting all dirty, and then you're, it's just your life's a mess. Well. Luckily, we have a new product out, and it is this wonderful bottle that will help you quench your thirst on demand no matter where you are. It's great, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I identify with the problem, but uh, the solution is amazing. <laughs> uh, cool. Let's do one more. Um, so there's more and more uh, empty storefront happening in uh, Manhattan is because the rent is going higher and higher and at the same time there's uh, uh, massive needs for independent designer uh, uh, for the storefront so design laundry try to find and renovate the underutilized under real estates uh, for the vendors um, months to month use yeah, cool. No, it's good. You you got half. I would add a little bit. Why is it different? Because I know there's a ton of sites that already does this. Uh, have you figured out a way? You know, why should I use this platform as opposed to all other ones? So, uh, what makes us different is we are architect and we are a salesperson. So we would create a space that is uh, different than the normal uh, flea market. Mm -hmm. So it is our skills or our advantage compared to other mm -hmm. uh, people doing the same thing. Okay, yeah. So try to add something that, you know, our team is focused on creating experiences that separates us from other vendors that are just posting listings. And since you're focusing towards the design center crowd, that would be something that differentiates you mm -hmm. as opposed to just, oh, here's a boring space, you know. Mm -hmm. But you kind of involve people into what can I make with this space? Right. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. Anyone else? <clears throat> One more. <laughs> yeah, brave. 
Okay. Um, our product is Dongguard. Dongguard provides prote uh, prote uh, uh, pr um, protection for your shins and provides hands-free lighting source. Our market is uh, industrial wor uh, industrial workers who work in dark places, uh, dark places like the MTA workers who maintain the rails. And our other market is for the enthusiast, uh, enthusiast sporting, uh, sporting market, like cavers, where, where there's a lot of um, like protections needed and lighting needed. So why not solve like two problems at once instead of having two separate products that solve one each? Thank you. Hmm. Cool. So uh, you started with the product, which is good. Uh, I would reiterate your customer and what is the problem? So you said in the, in the beginning somewhere that construction workers are uh, in dark environments, right? So I would start with, uh, you know, most construction happens in unsafe and dimly lit environments, uh, which causes a lot of accidents, I would assume, and uh, just unsafe working conditions, right? So you have developed a product that solves both needs in one. We created uh, an amazing shin protector with built-in LEDs that makes your work surface illuminate, you know? And then, oh, oh, interesting. So you started, again, a little bit with the problem, market, and then solution. So the structures there just sort of reshuffle that around. All right? Cool, guys, that's it. Just, uh, you know, polish and uh, get back to work. <laughs> awesome. Thank you.